On today's video, I'm going to show you guys how to set up our Unified 2 firmware from start to finish, including setting up VS Code. Let's get to it. Our Unified 2 firmware is a firmware that we put out that's built on top of Marlin. If you guys are not familiar with Marlin, Marlin is an open source firmware project that runs the majority of 3D printers on the market. You can get the firmware by going to uf2.th3dstudio.com. The Unified 2 firmware site has links to multiple different printers as well as different options depending on what board your printer has. If the name of the printer doesn't have any board following it, that means that it's going to work with the stock board and that printer is known to only have one board revision. Other printers like the Ender 3 and the Ender 5, you'll see different options that say 8-bit or 32-bit after the name, and that's because these printers actually ship with two different board versions. In addition to that, you'll also see different board options for aftermarket boards like our EasyBoard V2, the Creality 427, or some of the Big Tree Tech SKR E3 mini series. Now, most of the firmware on our site is available for a free download. And the way we structure the firmware is if it's a stock printer board, that firmware is free. And firmware for aftermarket boards like the Big Tree Tech SKR E3 mini series or the Creality 427 are available for a $5 download. Now that $5 download gets you access to the firmware and all updates for six months from purchase. You also have the option to add on technical support. So even if you're just buying the firmware and you add the technical support on, this gives you access to our technical support team should you have any questions with compiling. And we also include compile help. So if you send us your configuration file and you're having issues compiling, even with the help of this video, we'll go ahead and compile the firmware and send you the compiled bin file. Now, one thing I do want to touch here is that depending on what type of board you have, the flashing process will be different. And it's pretty simple to delineate the two. If you have an 8-bit board, you're going to be plugging your printer into your computer with a USB cable and you'll upload the firmware via the USB cable. If you have a 32-bit board, those printers will flash by putting a bin file on your SD card, putting it into the printer and turning the power on. At that point, the board will flash the new firmware and it'll be updated. One other thing I want to mention is that with certain 8-bit boards, you have to install what's called a bootloader on the printer. Now, typically, this is limited to the printers with what are called the 1284p CPUs. And if you look at the picture on screen here, this is what they look like. If you have a printer with that processor, we do have a different video on our channel here, as well as a software package to download that you can flash the bootloader with. We also sell a bootloader kit in our store called the Uno Bootloader Kit that is linked in the video description as well that you can use to install a bootloader on your 8-bit board if it's a board that does not have one. If you're not sure if your printer has a bootloader on it or not, if you try uploading the firmware to the board and it just times out, that typically means your board does not have a bootloader and it will need to have one flashed. Now, if you have an 8-bit board, because you're going to be using a USB connection to upload the firmware to the board, you're going to need to make sure you have the drivers for that USB to serial chip installed on your computer. Now, luckily, there's two major chips that are used. One is the CH340 and the other is the FT232R, both of which drivers are available in our help center. And the link is below. So the first thing we're going to need to do to actually compile the firmware once you have it downloaded is we're going to need to install Visual Studio Code on your computer. You can see the directions by going to vscode.th3dstudio.com and there's download links available to download VS Code as well as text directions to set up Visual Studio Code. In this video, I'm going to go over start to finish on installing VS Code on a fresh Windows 10 installation. So I'm going to switch over to my Windows 10 installation. And I'm going to show you guys how to set up Visual Studio Code. So I went to vscode.th3dstudio.com and we get the VS Code setup guide. If we go down in the page here, you can see we have a VS Code download page for Mac, Windows and Linux. I'm going to click that and then I'm going to download the installer for my operating system. In this case, on my Windows 10, so I'll click the Windows 10 install. Once the file is done downloading, go ahead and run it. And we're just going to run through the installation. The installation defaults are fine, so we're just going to basically keep clicking next through the installer. We'll go ahead and let that install, and we'll come right back. So now that Visual Studio has installed, I'm going to click Finish to launch it. And you can go ahead and customize the setup for your installation if you wish. 
In this case, I'm just going to hit Mark Done. Now I'm going to head back to the Help Center and click Unify 2 Firmware at the top. And for this example, we're just going to use a Creality Ender 3 firmware. I'm going to find my Ender 3 here. And I'm going to go ahead and download the 32-bit one. There's a picture of the printer in the board that the firmware is for, so you can double check that it matches what's actually on your machine. I'm going to go ahead and click Download, accept the terms, and then we'll get a zip file. So what we want to do with this zip file once it's done downloading is extract it to a folder on our computer and make sure you put it outside of a cloud storage folder. You don't want to put it in like your OneDrive folder or Google Drive or Dropbox or whatever other type of cloud storage you use because it can conflict when it's trying to synchronize files while VS Code is actually working on them. So I'm going to extract the folder here. What I like to do is copy the path here because it'll make it easier to open. Hit Extract. And then once this is done extracting, we're going to switch over to Visual Studio and we're going to open the firmware. So I have the files extracted. I'm going to switch back over to Visual Studio, hit Open Folder, and I'm going to paste in the path where I extracted the files to, hit Enter. And we're going to want to double click the firmware folder and then do not click any of these other folders. You're just going to go ahead and hit Select Folder. And at this point, the firmware is going to load in Visual Studio Code. Now in the newer Visual Studio Code, you'll see you'll get a trust box here. Go ahead and check the trust authors of files and then click Yes, I trust the authors. Now, if you look here in the bottom right hand corner, it's asking us to install the platform IO IDE extension. Go ahead and click install. And depending on the speed of your computer, this may take a minute. It might take up to 10 minutes. So we're going to let this install and this is necessary to compile the firmware. So once this is done installing, we'll come back and I'll show you guys how to actually use the firmware and build a file. You can see here in the bottom right hand corner, the platform IO installer has finished. So we're going to close VS Code and then relaunch it. If you guys notice, it already opened up the firmware because we had it open before. And there's little things going on in the background here where it's downloading different libraries that are needed. And we want to let that finish before we go any further. So you can see here, the little unpacking and updating has gone away. So now we can go ahead and edit the firmware. To do this, we're going to expand the Marlin folder on the left and double click configuration.h. And even though this is for the Ender 3, this layout is the same for all of our firmware versions. So no matter if you're using it on an Anycubic or Creality or Solval, we keep the configuration consistent. So you guys know how to use the firmware no matter what printer you're using it for. So like I said, I'm going to build for an Ender 3. And if all I'm doing is putting this on a stock Ender 3, I can just come over here and get rid of these two forward slashes in front of the define Ender 3. I'm going to do a control S to save. And now I can go ahead and click the little build icon in the bottom left hand corner. At this point, now it's going to actually compile the firmware. So again, depending on the speed of your computer, this can take anywhere from a minute up to five minutes to actually build the firmware. While this is going, you can see there are different printer models listed. And if you scroll down in the configuration file, you can see in most of the configs, there are multiple different printers supported. It's important to note that only compile for one printer at a time. What I typically will do is if I have multiple machines, I'll make multiple copies of that firmware folder and put it in a subfolder with that printer model name. So I know later on that that's the firmware for that particular printer. So I'm going to let this compile and then we're going to come back. So now you can see here the firmware successfully built. You can see at the bottom here, there's a success status. If there's any sort of errors, it'll show up if you scroll up in this window here. But for the stock configurations, you're rarely ever going to get any errors. So I put my SD card into my computer and you can see here we have the SD card open. So I'm going to format this with a FAT32 format with a 4096 allocation unit size. We're going to do that now. So I'm going to hit OK. And let's go ahead and open the card. Now, there are two ways to get your firmware file. You can do it directly through VS Code here on the left. And your file is going to be in the PIO build and then a folder with the processor name. And under this, you'll see a bin file. You're going to want to look for a file with a .bin extension. You can drag this from the VS Code window to the SD card directly, just like this. 
You can also right click on the CPU folder and hit reveal in file explorer and then double click and you'll also see the bin file. Now doing it this way is helpful if you have multiple bin files because sometimes you will end up with multiple ones if you're doing multiple compiles and you can sort by date modified and grab the latest one. So whatever the one you last compiled is will have the later date. So at this point, all I need to do is take the SD card out of my computer. I'm going to put it into my printer board, turn it on, and then it will flash. So now for those of you guys that have 8-bit boards, the flashing process is a little different. So right now I have my printer's control board plugged into my computer. And instead of hitting the little check mark for build, I'm going to actually click upload. Now, before I do that, one thing I want to mention is if you have a computer that has multiple COM ports, you may have to tell it what COM port you have. To determine what that is, you can go ahead and click the little platform IO home button. And then you'll go to devices. And it will show you all the COM ports. Now, on this computer, I only have one device. Now, if you have multiple devices and you're not sure what port your printer is on, you can go ahead and unplug the USB cable hit refresh and see what disappears. The COM port that disappears is the one your printer's on. So now I plug the printer back into my computer and we can see COM3 has shown up. So in the event that you need to specify the COM port your printer's on, you can go ahead and click the COM port name. You're going to drop down into the INI file and then open the AVR.INI. Now, depending on what type of board you have, you're going to need to make the change in a different section. To figure out what that is, we can go ahead and open the platform io.ini file here on the left. So in the platform io file, it will tell you what environment we're going to need to set the COM port under. In my case, this is the Melzi OptiBoot Optimized. In your case, it might be Mega2560. Those are the two main 8-bit boards we'll be flashing for if you're using our firmware. So now I know I need to make the changes under the Melzi OptiBoot Optimized section. So I'm going to go back to the AVR INI, scroll down until I find it. And you can see it here at the bottom. I'm going to remove the little pound sign in front of upload port. And I'm going to get rid of the COM1. And I'm going to paste in that COM port that I copied from earlier. So now the firmware knows that our printer's on COM3. At this point, I can go ahead and hit the upload button. And now it's going to compile and then upload to the board. Now again, if you only have one COM port listed, you do not need to make this change. I'm only mentioning this because on some of my computers, there's virtual COM ports for different management devices on certain Intel platforms that show up as a COM port. So this will typically prevent the auto detect from working. So that's why we have the option here to specify the COM port to upload to the board. So as you can see here, it went and compiled the firmware and now it's going to be uploading the firmware to the printer's control board. In this time, do not touch anything on the printer. Don't try to use the LCD. And if you'll notice, the LCD actually will not be responding at this time. It's going to write the file over the USB to the printer CPU, and then it'll do a verify. And after it's done with that, we'll see a success box, just like we saw with the 32-bit ones. And at that point, the firmware is done and it's updated on your board. So as you can see here, we have a success at the bottom. If we look at the printer, when you turn it on, you'll see our logo and you'll see the version number of the firmware you just uploaded to it. So now the next thing we need to do is reset the EEPROM and you should do this every time you reflash because if you don't, some settings changes that you made may not apply. So to do that, you can either do it through the LCD, which I'm gonna show you now, or if you know how to connect to your printer over serial connection, you can also do that with the G code command M502 followed by M500. So I'm gonna show you with the LCD right now. I'm gonna press the button on the encoder here, go down to configuration, go down to reset EEPROM, and then select reset. At this point, if you have a beeper on your screen, it'll make a little confirmation beep, and then it'll say settings stored. At this point, the EEPROM is now reset. So now that we've gone over the basic steps to compile a stock printer firmware, I wanna show you guys a bunch of things that we have in our firmware to do different upgrades, whether it be an easy ABL bed leveling sensor or adding on our NeoPixel LEDs or just changing your extruder. 
So we're gonna go through and give you guys a little quick tour of all the other options in the firmware. So as you can see here, I have the Configuration H file open. Depending on what board you have, there may or may not be different options, but in general, our configuration layout is going to be the same across all printer boards and manufacturers. So if we scroll down past all the setup for the actual printer model, you'll see we get into our upgrade settings. So we have here on this particular printer, we have different options for our filament sensor kits. We also have options for the stock filament sensor for some Creality machines. You'll also see our ABL probe mounts, and these will vary based on what model you have. And these are mounts that we have already measured and taken the offsets so you don't have to, meaning you can just tell the printer what mount you're using and it'll auto configure all those settings for you. Now, if you're using a custom probe setup, meaning one that we haven't predefined, we do also have an option called custom probe right here. If we scroll down, you can see there's other specific options for these particular models that this firmware supports. We have settings here for Easy Neo RGB LED lighting kits. And then if we scroll down here, we have advanced settings for our Easy ABL. Certain settings in this section also change different values for different probes. One of those examples being the probe edge. If we keep scrolling down here, this is where you enter in your probe offsets if you're using a custom mount for our Easy ABL, or if you're using a BL Touch, this will also use that section as well. We have different options for custom extruder setups. So if you've changed your extruder from the stock one and you need to change your steps per millimeter, you can do that here. You can also reverse your motor direction. We have different tweaks for if your filament sensor is mounted or if it's on a direct drive printer to change the length that it loads and unloads. We also have thermistor settings for your hot end and your bed. And then there's a miscellaneous category here where you can change the knob direction if for some reason yours is going the wrong way. Different settings for 5015 fans that might have a whining if they're under 100% speed. We also have a little fun one here that you can give your printer a custom name that will show up on the LCD. We also have other tweaks in most of the configs to change a axis direction. So if you've modified the printer and it's not moving the stock way, you can go ahead and change that here as well. In the section here, we have our community requested features. These are basically bonuses that they're in the firmware, but we do not cover them with our support because they are either fringe use cases or they're more complicated things that are for advanced users. One of those things is the new input shaping. And what input shaping is, is a way to print faster with your existing hardware. We do have a link here if you wanna read up on that. We have what are called your home offset adjustments. So let's say you change your printer's hot end and it's no longer in the factory location, you know, your nozzle moved. You can go ahead and tell it the new settings. So we do have that setting available. We can also enable what's called PID bed temperature regulation, which I don't recommend, but it's there if you wanna use it. We also have a finer adjustment for doing baby stepping on your printer. And that's the live adjustment of your Z height while it's printing. We also have linear advance, BL touch, and even a manual mesh leveling. So this is, if you don't have an auto bed leveling probe and you wanna take manual measurements of different probe points, you can actually do that in software here as well. We have power loss recovery, which is a feature that's built in the Marlin. I'm not personally a huge fan of, but it will continually write to the SD card, the position it's at. So if you lose power, it'll resume. This does cause wear on your SD card. So that's one of the reasons we don't recommend using it, but it's there in case you guys do want to use it and go through SD cards. On certain options where you have to enter in a value, you will sometimes have to uncomment another line above that value to get it to take effect. So one of those things, as an example, is the E-steps. So right now you can see this is uncommented because it's lit up a different color, but this value will not take effect. In order to get it to actually take the steps per millimeter we enter here on this line, we have to uncomment this line and you'll see it now lights up. So if I were to recompile the firmware and put it on my printer board, it will then take this ESTAB value instead of the one that's pre-programmed for the stock extruder that comes on whatever printer you're flashing. This is also the same way for the thermistor type. So let's say I swapped out my hot end thermistor and I know the value is number five. And this is in relation to the Marlin thermistor values, which are located in our help center if you want to look them up. So let's say I know I'm putting a different thermistor in my hot end and I know it's thermistor value five. I would uncomment both of these lines and then replace this X here with the number thermistor that I'm going to be using. So the last thing I wanna cover, and this applies to only certain printer configurations, is the environment that you're going to be building for. On certain printer boards, they have different CPUs that came with these boards, and sometimes it requires you changing the environment to get it to work. 
If yours is one of these that could have multiple different processor types, you can read the information here and it'll tell you how to change it. And those changes are in the platform io.ini file. And we do a good job at keeping notes here as to what CPUs are for what environment. So for example, let's say my Creality board has one of the knockoff Giga device processors. I can go ahead and just copy this and paste it here. And now it'll change for what processor it's building the firmware for. Now in the Creality instance, most of the time you don't need to change this, but if you are having issues, we'd recommend that you look at the processor on your board and then make sure that the processor matches the environment value that the firmware is being built for. So we've gone over how to download the firmware, set up Visual Studio Code from scratch, I showed you how to build for a 32-bit and an 8-bit board, and gave you a little tour of all the extra settings in our firmware. Now, if you're stuck and having issues trying to get the firmware working, we do have paid support services available where you can pay us a small fee and we'll be able to help you with getting your firmware set up and even doing compiles for you where we would send you the file to flash for your board. If you have a product like our Easy ABL or one of our Easy Boards that come with included technical support, if you are having problems, you can go ahead and send us a ticket and we'll be able to give you a hand under the technical support for that particular product. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I hope it demystified some of the things about how to use our firmware. And as always, happy printing.